Welcome to the University of Life and this presentation, Ways of Knowing and the Intuitive Connection. I built this for a class I'm giving this weekend, and I'm going to try and do a really fast overview without going into too many details for you, which is not as easy as it sounds, but let's get started. First off, I want to set the big picture, put everything in context with this question. What is knowing? And the answer is it simply comes down to your brain making new connections. I've watched a video of this with uh, brain neurons kind of wiggling around and connecting, making a new connection. If you think it and reinforce it long enough, then it sticks around. That's what this image is all about, all these little dots and the lines between them. That's meant to represent the neurons in your brain making all these connections, and that's how you know stuff. Really, it's not like you know anything. It's just you choose to believe something firmly enough that we use the word know. So know is just a strong belief. You're sure of it. You're certain because of the evidence or whatever you use to prove it to yourself. But really, it's just a strong belief. And it doesn't always have anything to do with accuracy. It may not represent the real physical world out there. It's just your best estimate of it. It's the way you process knowledge. You receive data and process it. So that's what we call knowing. And as a result, sometimes things that we say are common sense, oh, it's so obvious, everyone knows that, it turns into confirmation bias where your your brain, because your brain, if it knows something, then it scans the world for things that match that. It's like the matching game where you turn over a card, oh, here's an airplane, oh, here's a firefighter, you try and match it up. And so whatever you already believe, whatever your context and your experience already contain, you look around and you recognize those things in the world while other things seem invisible to you. Like when you learn a new word, and it suddenly it seems like everybody else learned the word at the exact same time as you because now they're all using it as well. And they were already using it, you just didn't notice it before. In the end, life is 100% subjective. So even if you believe in some objective fact, you know, maybe there is an objective fact. I mean, there are facts out there. The universe is such and such a way. But your experience of knowing it, that's subjective. That's your experience of believing this data. I'm going to introduce you briefly to a couple of pioneers, people who provided some really quite useful information about ways of knowing, and then we'll talk about other ways of knowing, including sensation and intuition. So William Perry was an educational psychologist, Mary Belenke and, and the group she worked with also academics, and Perry studied Harvard men in the 50s and 60s, and Belenke and her group, they studied women in all walks of life. And they came up with three primary categories, three or four primary categories. First one's dualism, that's Perry's word, and Blanky called this received knowing. And this is basically seeing the world as black and white, right or wrong, and you believe authority figures. So people tell you something, and that's how you know it, because somebody who you trust told you it's true. And that's very appropriate for some circumstances. Um, in, And it's, for example, when you're a child, it's super important to have this sense that the world is safe. It's simple enough, it's not super overwhelming. Like when my youngest sister came home from first grade one day and she pointed west and said, that way is north. And I pointed north and said, no, I, that way is north. She said, ah, it's that way because my teacher said so and she's a teacher. And I was in grad school teaching college at the time as a TA. And I said, well, I'm a teacher, but that was too much complexity for her. So she just dismissed me offhand. And, that's just fine. The next stage that uh, Perry students would sometimes reach is multiplism. And Blanky called kind of a parallel, she called it subjective knowing. And in multiplism, you begin to realize that there are many opinions that are sometimes contradictory, but can be equally valid. And the world is not all dualistic, not all black and white. In Blanky's instance, uh, these were sometimes women who had maybe been oppressed. And so they're fighting back and they're saying, well, I have my opinion. And sometimes they throw the baby out with the bathwater and they actually distrust authority figures and even logic and rational you know, reasoning. Uh, Perry's third stage, relativism. This is where it gets more complex, better able to deal with the world to say, sometimes one thing is good and sometimes for some other person, something else is, is better. Should you wear a coat when you go outside? Well, it depends. Is it winter or is it summer? If it's winter, yes, wear a coat. Um, maybe somebody is having a hard time and where you need someone to say, buck up and do it. Someone else just needs a hug, you know, and then they can get back on their feet. So you kind of try and pick the best way to deal with this. Belenke in a kind of parallel concept, she calls this constructed knowledge, knowing. 
where you receive information from others, but you process it with your, yourself and you decide what your own opinion is. And you feel comfortable with that, but you're open to other information. Uh, all of Perry's, these three Perry stages, they can be broken down to two or three sub stages. And one of them, which is worth mentioning is called commitment. And this is where rather than weighing the pros and cons of every situation over and over again, you get comfortable and say, look, this is my opinion. I don't have to rethink it every time because that's exhausting and I'm comfortable with it. But you remain open to more information. And on the other end of the scale, Belenke noticed one which is terrifying. It's such a tragedy that she calls it silence. And this is where women have been in such abusive situations where they have not even developed their own inner voice. They don't even think inside their head. They view language as just another tool for people to control other people. So tragic. Um, Anyway, there's some ways of knowing. Are those all? No, of course not. Let's jump on to sensation. This is where you receive data from the five senses and you process that. And we like to think that if you experience it yourself, that's it. It's sure. You know it absolutely because you saw it, you felt it, you breathed it, whatever. And we say seeing is believing. But in reality, much of the time, it's the opposite. Believing is seeing. Again, what you have in your context in your brain, you scan for that and just reaffirm, reaffirms and confirms what you already believe and you kind of throw out evidence to the contrary. So you might see this picture of beautiful autumn shot in Colorado with autumn leaves and snow-capped mountains. You might see that and say, let's go for a walk. But if you inside your head, you have anxieties and fears and unresolved traumas, then you're scanning for that, right? Because that's what's in your head. Those are the feelings and thoughts deep in there. And so instead of wanting to go for a walk in this beautiful woods, forest, you might see a bear behind every tree. And it paints your world, your context really paints your world so much. All right, let's go on to intuition. Intuition has various uh, various types or various definitions. Some of them just describe cognitive processes, like your brain kind of figuring out. And so when you're consciously just reach a snap decision really easily. Those are not the ones I'm talking about when I use the word intuition. I mean, observing and interpreting non-sensory, so not your five senses, and non-cognitive, so not thinking, data. Thirst is a good example to sort us at the stage for this. You might think, oh, well, that's a feeling, that's sensory. What are you talking about, Roundy? But it's actually not. It's not, not the same way as like touching your fingertip. That's a nerve ending. But thirst actually operates by neurotransmitters. When you get dehydrated to a certain point, your brain puts these out and it makes you feel thirsty and it tells your lungs to not release so much uh, water vapor in, in your breath to help preserve it. But it's a feeling we're familiar with. You feel that and you know, oh, I'm thirsty, I need to drink. And it's obviously not just the fact that your throat is dry, because if you took one swallow of water, that would wet your throat and you wouldn't be thirsty anymore. But that doesn't happen. Sometimes you need to drink a lot more before your body gets back up to that homeostasis it likes. Emotions are another one. Uh, the hypothalamus puts out these feelings in reaction to your thoughts and feelings and various triggers and stimuli around you. And we react to them and if you're not very emotionally mature, you blame the stimulus. If somebody cuts you off in traffic, you're like, you jerk, you made me mad. But if you're more emotionally mature, you realize, oh, this anger just poured out in my head, but it's not that wasn't really so bad. And you take a deep breath and you let it go and you deal with it. And you live a more conscious quality life because of it. Then we get into other things. I'm still talking about internal, measuring internal senses thing. And in the West, of course, we love science. Uh, since the scientific revolution, we really we believe things like that. If you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. But in Eastern philosophy, I guess you could call it, there are a lot of things that we can sense, that our mind can sense, and we just don't happen to have the technology to measure it enough. I mean, we, we do, we can measure these things, but not enough to really show exactly what's going on. And so they're less well understood. Chi, chi, that's the same word, just to romanizations of the Chinese. Prana means the same thing as the energy that flows through you. And chakras are different spots in your body uh, through which the energy flows that have different meanings and can be very helpful. So if your throat feels all closed up, you might say, oh, that's my throat chakra, and realize, why do I not feel free to speak out? You know, and you can clear the energy and suddenly change your habits and everything. And then the last one I'll mention, I guess we can call it ESP, extrasensory perception. So again, non-sensory data coming in, like 
the stories of the twins who moved to LA and New York and the one in New York it's an accident the one in California calls and says what's wrong I just know something's wrong there's no way to sense that so maybe it's entanglement right maybe these two twins entanglement theory if you're familiar with that where they're connected and we have these things called biophotons in our brain it's just basically light in the visible spectrum that's created as we think and so maybe that's used in some of this there's no evidence for that i don't know if that's true that's just the most recent thing i read and i thought it was interesting so i'll hold that as a possibility until hopefully we can measure this stuff in the next 10 years and understand it even more but in the meantime it works and the vast amount of anecdotal evidence tells us we can't ignore it even if we can't completely prove exactly how it all works in a minute we'll move on i'll tell you about the intuitive connection and this connection between people basically reading minds but not the way you're thinking and then uh, intuitive bridge is an advanced application of, an, of the intuitive connection but before we go there i'd like to give you a second to process this information and apply it to yourself so if you're watching this with someone else please take a minute and answer these questions what do you know what are you so certain of that you say you know it not just believe and how certain are you which type of knowing is most valid do you trust things that people tell you more or things that you've experienced for yourself and it's probably a situational thing right i would rather taste the menu than have someone tell me oh that's delicious I'm looking at a picture on a piece of plastic coated paper which type of knowing do you rely on most think of a few situations how much is your perception influenced by experience? So think of someone who has a very different opinion from a different background and ask yourself, are you really being fair and considering both sides? Or are you just really swayed from your experience and the beliefs that happen to be in your head already? And lastly, how much are your beliefs influenced by emotions? Your brain is designed to have those emotions control you much more than your conscious mind. We like to think we're perfectly rational, but we're not. So the more aware you can become of that, the more control you can gain and try and make good choices that are in your best interest. So pause the video, discuss those for a minute, and I'll see you in a second. All right, now let's move on to the intuitive connection. I'm gonna tell you how to have your own experience of this, but I'm gonna start with this question. How do you feel about eye contact? Does it make you at all nervous? Does it make you feel vulnerable? Or maybe it feels really good and so nurturing and just this amazing connection between people. However you react, it's just some evidence, some pretty good evidence, I think, that there's more to your eyes than pretty colored circles with black dots in the middle. They really are the window of the soul. And when you experience this for yourself, you can start to become aware of what this intuitive connection is and how it works. A lot of people will say, oh, you're just reading body language and micro expressions. Uh, and if you don't know what those are, please look them up. Interesting things, very interesting. But those kind of signals, those physical signals, they don't make you feel vulnerable. And not only that, but people can mislead with that. They can use body language to look really confident and trustworthy. But when you really connect with people with the intuitive connection, you look past all that much deeper down and people really can't deceive you on that level not once you have practice it does take some practice this intuitive connection is a cultural thing in the west like i said we if we can't measure it we don't believe it so we disregard a lot of feelings you know we just want logic but in japan for example i learned in one of the most interesting college classes i took cross-cultural communications that even in big business you're sitting down to a business deal to sign billion dollar contract with some other company and they'll sit down and they'll just stare at each other for 20 minutes because they want to know is this person i'm going into business with are they trustworthy is this someone i want to work with so they're aware of it and they use it and we would benefit if we did too so we'll do three things we first i'll have you experience it and i'll give you all the steps explain how to do that and then you'll pair up with a partner and try this so then share with each other and then I have some discussion questions to go from there and by the way this is all in my book true you 
and I just put a bunch of really nice essays in there about how crucial it is to be seen on this level. It's a really essential basic human need that would do people a lot of good. It tells you how to do this. It answers all the questions that everyone has ever asked me about it. And I've taught this to thousands of people and much more. So if you're interested in that, check it out on Amazon. You can also find it at uoflife.com slash books. All right, experience. Let's have your own experience. First off, know that eye contact makes the intuitive connection easier to detect. It's really not necessary, but if it's if you're new to this, it makes it a lot easier to recognize the feelings, the impressions that are hitting your brain and become more aware of them and interpret them. You're going to look at each other for five minutes. So set a timer or something. And if that makes you uncomfortable, remember, that's just more evidence that there is something to this and you better find out what it is. Blinking is okay. This is not a blink, a staring contest. And if you're doing this in a large group, I always request people to be quiet during this time to not distract others. And I, there's a pattern I always see too. For the first minute or so, people are really uncomfortable. They're giggling and squirming and looking away and making little comments, you know. But after about a minute, you know, they relax and realize that it's okay to broach, break this little social norm. And and this connection starts happening. And this really cool feeling in the room starts up and by the time five minutes are over they can't believe the time has already passed and they're pretty excited about what happened at least it happened at least 95 percent of the time on average maybe a little more some people are too self-conscious it doesn't work so well but overall it works great during this time clear your thoughts don't overthink that just if you have thoughts just just let them float away and instead you're going to wait for an impression or a feeling or even a sensation to strike you. And when that happens, you're gonna hold on to that feeling or impression or sensation until your conscious mind translates it into language, until you understand it consciously what that feeling is. Sometimes this will happen quickly if you're familiar with that impression, and sometimes you'll hold a feeling for a while and it'll take a while for you to really make sense of it. And every once in a while, you'll get it and it'll be a worldview so different than yours that you'll think, I never would have come to that conclusion on my own. It's so interesting to see how other people see the world. Visualizing these sensations or feelings, impressions may help you hold on to them long enough until your mind can interpret them, turn them into language. And so just create any metaphor, you know, if it feels like a big lump, think of it like that. If it looks like a puppy, fine, you know, it doesn't matter. So that's what you'll do. Five minutes, clear your thoughts, eye contact, and just pay attention to your feelings and interpret them. Then you'll share with your partner what you've experienced. And here are some questions. I have this divided into two because I'll put people in pairs and then we'll have a group discussion about it. What did you experience? How reliable is this data that you just received and interpreted? Sometimes it was really hazy and you're not sure of it at all. But as you practice and people confirm, yeah, that's true of me, or, you, or as you get really specific things that you couldn't have known otherwise, you come to trust it more and more and more. What applications can you imagine for intuitive connection? Well, it can, it's so nurturing. How about kids who are acting out in school who aren't loved enough at home, who need to feel seen and reaffirmed? How about any relationship just to strengthen it and get to know each other better? How about beginning relationships where you're deciding whether you like this person, whether you trust them or not, um, and strengthening relationships? There's lots of great applications for it. So do that. Go ahead and pause your video here. I'll rewind this to the steps. There you go. Do that for five minutes and then play the video again. And I'll take you to the advanced application of these skills. All right, so share what you experienced. And now let's take a look at Intuitive Bridge, advanced application. And this deals with a question that I found maybe 15 years ago of whether or not this intuitive connection is a two-way street. I mean, I can read people, I can see things in them, I got very good at that, but can I also kind of push information? Can I influence them as well? That was my question, so I decided to experiment. And the second time I tried this, I had the experience which was just 
incredibly confirming that it works. And of course, I've had thousands of them since. And then since I'm trying to go short, I won't tell you that story, but you can find it online or in the long version. If you want to really learn to do this and read other people and influence them, then learn to speak subconscious languages. And you can't really control your subconscious, so you need something that your conscious mind understands, but that your subconscious also does, a common language, a lingua franca. And there are two of them. There's imagery, so you can create any metaphor to represent feelings and concepts, and that works. And there's also emotion. This really helps you get in touch with your subconscious and find out what's in there and influence it. And really what Intuitive Bridge is primarily about, it's about healing. So if people have fears, if they have stuck emotion, if they have limited thoughts, you can find those and you can influence them. That's what my story was. I didn't tell you a minute ago, but understand subconscious priorities and processes. So really the science of the of the brain what we've learned about how the brain works is so useful to know what's going on and one thing that's going on in the subconscious is it's trying to survive it's one of its primary motives is to keep the human race alive and so when it recognizes threats it often responds by protecting itself and shutting down and blocking out and you can recognize these things these prevent people from living a more full life and so sometimes they're kind of dark and dense and what you want to do is get them to soften up and lighten up and and relax and be more flexible and and work better so one way you can find these is you can just visualize a net passing through the person and, and it kind of gets stuck it gets caught on the hard hot hard spots that's just one of hundreds of techniques to make this stuff work and your goal is to make the mind feel safe because it's going to be defensive i mean these stuck spots are there for protection right but if you can make it feel safe enough then it can relax and lowers defenses and so go in without judgment and also don't go in and just look at the negative oh that hurts Ooh, that's scary oh yeah come in with hope with a sense of love with optimism determination strength protection you know and think those thoughts feel them at the same time as you feel the negatives that you're exploring and they actually kind of mix blending i call that and instruct it and change things in often dramatic fashion show it a new perspective as it does and as you do this for your guidance do what feels right this is not a time to rely on your logic trust your intuition logic and rational thinking here is limited because if someone's afraid you might think oh they just need more courage but that may not be the ideal solution to help heal the emotions and really get them back on their feet so go with what feels right and let yourself be led by that it works so much better don't go in with too much ego either just pushing away your pushing around your way do what do the right thing and it takes some practice to but if it feels good it feels right that's basically what i use to decide and i know this is just a really quick brief overview but i wrote this book 320 pages a couple years ago and it leads you simply short chapters from really simple things it explains how the brain works and it gives you techniques to begin enhancing your intuition and then hundreds of things to do with it because to use it is in particular for healing as i found things you know as i worked with people and and their defense just would not drop i think well that doesn't work well what does and i'd find another technique that did work and uh, so there they all are in heal your emotions also on amazon and youoflife.com slash books kindle or paperback versions for you and that's it there's your brief lecture of ways of knowing and the intuitive connection i hope you found it useful i hope you found it interesting i hope you'll take these skills and practice them and enrich your life so much and i hope that as you do you'll share them with other people point them to this video so that other people can discover this thing that they've been missing out on it really is fantastic it's such a useful step to make it a higher quality life that's what the University of Life is all about. So thanks for listening. I'll tune in next time. And until then, as always, live smart, live happy.